disease detection. How liquid biopsy can revolutionize medical diagnostics. Dennis Lo, the Chinese University of Hong Kong. On November the 9th, 1989, I was a junior doctor working in Birmingham in the UK. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's my honor to present in front of this exciting conference. So today, I'd like to tell you a story, a story of myself developing from a student into a clinician scientist. And the story actually started 30 years ago when I was still a medical student at Oxford. So as a medical student, I have to study different medical specialties. And one of those is obstetrics. So I learned about how when a woman is pregnant, she would like to know about the genetic health of the baby. But at, time, at that time, the most accurate method is to stick a needle into the uterus and take some fluid out through a process called amniocentesis. But every time we do this, there's a 0.5% chance that the baby might be harmed or even killed. So as a young medical student, I was wondering, why did doctors do such dangerous things? Can we not just develop a blood test which we can take from mother and be able to tell something about the baby's DNA? So I was dreaming about a possibility whether maybe some fetal cells may gain access into mother's blood. But the question is, how do you show that? So I was thinking that maybe if a baby is a boy, then if my finger is correct, then the baby boy would start to release male fetal cells in the bloodstream of the mother. And so I want to try that. And so I actually managed to persuade a professor in Oxford to let me test it out in his laboratory. Now, for example, here you see a blood film in which there are many blood cells, but four of those have a black dot in them. And actually, those are male fetal cells. So we actually show from that experiment that indeed uh, fetal cells enter mother's blood. And also, I can actually use a process of DNA amplification to try to detect that signal. And I actually even managed to actually publish that work uh, in a prestigious journal called Lancet just in a year when I qualify. And then after qualification, I have to do one year as an intern. But during that year, I keep on thinking about this project. Because I think that I've started this field, I like to be able to finish it. And so after that one year, I decided to go back to Oxford to do a, a PhD. Now, so this is a picture of myself, actually, as a PhD student. You can see that I'm completely wrapped up a little bit like a terrorist. And the reason is because I use a Y chromosome, the male chromosome, as a marker of fetal cells. But my whole body, every cell has a Y chromosome. So basically, I'm trying to protect my samples from myself. But once I've started that project full time, I realized it's not as simple as I had imagined. Because while we can detect those fetal cells in mother's blood, the concentration is extremely low. It's almost like you're trying to hunt for that needle in a haystack. So after three and a half years, I tried different methods, but somehow I just could not get a test to work very robustly. So the research during that three and a half years was very difficult, but but interesting, I actually spent some time for some extracurricular activities. So I actually knew my wife, and actually eventually we got married. So my wife Alice is in the audience today. And so after that period, I have to come back to reality and actually go back to train as a junior doctor and actually try to do this research on and off in the sideline. And times flight, and very soon it was 1997. So I've been working on this project on and off for eight years. So 97 was a year when Hong Kong went back to Chinese sovereignty. So my wife and I thought that that might be a good time to go back to Hong Kong, especially when our parents are still in Hong Kong. So I joined the Chinese University of Hong Kong. And interestingly, about three months before I left the UK back to Hong Kong, I saw in this scientific magazine that two papers which says that cancer cells will release this DNA into the plasma of cancer patients. Now, the plasma is actually this yellow fluid that blood cells swim in. And suddenly, I have an interesting idea. I thought that a cancer growing in a patient is actually a little bit like a baby growing inside a mother. So I thought that if a cancer cell can release its DNA into this plasma, 
maybe the baby will do the same. So in other words, what I was thinking about is that over the last eight years, I was wasting my time trying to look for fetal cells. Maybe the stuff I want to look at is in between the cells in that fluid. But the problem is that at that time, I was just returning from the UK back to Hong Kong. I don't have a lot of resources, I don't have grants. So I can only do something very cheap, but I have no idea how to extract this DNA from plasma. And then I recall, as a medical student, sometimes I had enough of the college food. And so sometimes I'd actually go back to my room and I cook instant noodles. And of course, to cook noodles, what you do is that you boil some water, and then you put the noodles in for five minutes, and then you get your noodles. So I was thinking, well, if you want something very cheap, how about I just took some plasma and just boil it for a few minutes and take some of that juice to test? And you probably think I'm crazy. But interestingly, sometimes craziness helps. So you can see that with that boiled plasma, I was actually able to see this male chromosome signal in some samples and no signal in others. As it turned out, all the samples with male signal are from mothers carrying baby boy. So this was the first demonstration of the presence of fetal DNA in maternal plasma. And then I tried to measure the concentration of this DNA. Actually, I find that by the 10 weeks of gestation, some 15% of DNA in the mother's plasma is from the baby, which is incredible in measuring the size of a mother versus a baby. So much difference. So this is a far cry from the hunting of the needle in the haystack, which I've been looking for the previous eight years. And then, very rapidly, we translate this discovery into a series of tests. Like I was able to determine the sex of a baby, which is useful because some genetic diseases like hemophilia are sex-linked. And I can also use this technology to determine the blood group type of the baby. Now, so those two tests are now actually in routine use in many parts of the world, and actually over 99% accurate. And then I became more ambitious. I was thinking, well, the number one reason why pregnant women go for prenatal testing is because they're worried that a baby might be suffering from Down syndrome. So Down syndrome is caused by a baby having an extra copy of chromosome 21. So I was thinking, well, can this technology be used for Down syndrome? But unfortunately, as it turned out, this is very difficult. It actually took me from 97 to 2008 to work this out. So sometimes thinking that I was lucky that I could start early Otherwise, I'll probably be retired before I even have a bit of data. And the reason why it's difficult is because the sexing and the blood group typing are yes or no answers. But for Down syndrome, you have to count how many chromosomes the baby has got. And the counting is difficult because most of the DNA in mother's blood is the mother's own DNA. And you don't have a nice cell membrane to partition the chromosomes together. So it's very difficult. So eventually, in 2008, we realized that one way to do that is to sequence millions of DNA molecules in the mother's plasma, and then map each of those sequences back to the chromosome from which it comes from. And then I can work out the ratio of different chromosomes in plasma. And interestingly, when we got the result, I was surprised, because initially I thought, well, if you have a test which is like 90% accurate, we'd be pretty good. But eventually, we actually find that the test was 99.7% accurate. And it was so accurate that actually within 10 months after we published this result, the test was launched clinically in the US. So now we're talking about six years into the practice of this technology, which is now generally called NIPT, or non-invasive prenatal testing. So the test is now available in over 90 countries, and millions of pregnant women are tested every year. Now, for example, this year, in China alone, we actually performed 4 million NIPT. So many people actually think this is the most rapidly adopted genomic test ever. So it seems that the goal that I set myself back in 89 has largely been completed. But then I'm still not quite ready to retire just yet. And so I was thinking, well, what else can I do? And if you're trying to push this to the limit, then the question has to be, can you sequence the whole genome of the baby by using this method? And this is a tough nut to crack because the genome has got billions of code and then it's fragmented into millions of pieces and mixed with the mother's DNA. So initially, I have no idea how do you do this. But one day, I actually went to see a movie with my wife, which is in 3D. So I remember sitting in a cinema like this, put on my 3D glasses and waiting for the movie to start. And suddenly, I actually see the Harry Potter sign flying towards me in 3D. 
And then my eyes was caught on the left-hand side at this edge. I was looking at that two-stroke, which actually interesting at that time looks to me like a pair of chromosomes. <laughs> so I told my wife, who was sitting next to me, that I said, well, I think I have an idea. Because what I realized is that for every pair of chromosomes the baby has got, one copy is from a father and one copy is from a mother. Maybe I need two algorithms to try to crack this problem. So what I realized at that time is this. Let's say that this picture is the father's genome, and this one is the mother's genome. So a baby has one half from a father and the other half from a mother. So now in the mother's blood, there's a lot of a mother's genome floating around, and you're trying to crack the yellow fetal genome. So two algorithms. So the first algorithm is try to crack the father's half. So you compare the father's genome with the mother's genome, and then try to find things which is only present in the father's eye, but absent in the mother's eye, but which is easy to find, like the flower. And then you go into the mother's blood, and then you try to hunt for the flower. So every time you see a flower, there's a little bit of the stuff that the baby has inherited from her father. And then you zip all those flowers together, and out come the father's half of a fetal genome. But how about the mother's side? The mother's side is more difficult because the baby's DNA is swimming in this ocean of mother's DNA. So any flower that the mother gives the baby, the mother will have it herself. So you cannot use the first strategy. So if you do something cleverer, so what I realized is that the mother's genome, the left-hand half and the right-hand half, is normally present in a ratio of one to one, just like my left hand and my right hand. But if the mother passes the right-hand side to the baby, and the baby releases a bit of that back in the mother's blood, so inside the mother's blood, the right-hand side should be higher than left-hand side in concentration. So basically, what you go is that you go into the blood, and then you count the concentration of the two halves. The half which is in excess is a half inherited by baby. So after the, the movie is finished, I rushed back home, wrote this all down, and I spent the next 18 months doing this. And eventually, we actually were able to decipher the whole genome of the baby by using this method. So of course, this method now allows us basically to use NIPT for any genetic disease that the baby has got. So, so you see how this field has developed. So I read about this cancer DNA in the circulation that inspired me to look for fetal DNA in mother's blood. So now the fetal side is going so well that maybe we can actually feed back some of that technology back into the cancer field. And in this regard, I was particularly interested in a type of cancer called nasopharyngeal cancer, which affect the head and neck region at the back of the nose, at the top of the throat. Now this cancer is very common in China, in South China. I actually lost one of my best friends to this disease. Now, for example, if you look at a Cantonese man like myself, my risk of having this cancer in a lifetime is about 1 in 39. But like many cancer, the earlier you can detect it, the better is the outcome. Now, if you detect in stage 1, like the top line, the long-term prognosis is over 90%. But if you discover in stage 4, then the survival drops to 65%. But despite the advanced healthcare we have in Hong Kong, some 76% of this cancer is only discovered late. So we want to do something about that. So I want to actually develop a blood test about that. And we're very lucky that actually this cancer has a virus associated with it. So I hypothesized a few years back that maybe as part of this biology, this cancer cell will release this virus DNA into the bloodstream, a little bit like the baby who is a boy releasing the Y chromosome into the bloodstream of the mother. And so we developed this into a test, which actually worked pretty well. And recently, we actually completed a large-scale trial of this technology to screen for nasopharyngeal cancer in healthy men in Hong Kong. We actually looked at 20,000 men. And actually, out of that, we're able to detect 34 cases of this cancer. Now, on the right-hand side is what happened now with our screening. So you can see that most of this cancer that we detect in Hong Kong is in late stage, stage 3 and stage 4. On the left-hand side is what happened if we use this DNA screening. We shift the statistic completely so that actually over 70% is detected in stage 1 and stage 2. And furthermore, when you actually follow those individuals up, you actually find that the individual with a screen cancer have a 10 times improvement in survival as compared with the non-screen cases. So we believe actually if I'm able to roll this technology out in China nationwide, 
that actually within a few years, the mortality of this cancer will easily be halved. But we believe actually this nasopharyngeal cancer is only the beginning. It's only showing us what we can achieve with DNA screening in the circulation. And now we're actually assembling the tools to generalize this to other cancer types. If we can do that, we're actually going to have a very powerful weapon against this big killer. So in conclusion, hope I've convinced you that circulating DNA is the treasure trove for molecular diagnostics. With it, the era of non-invasive prenatal testing is already with us. <coughs> and we actually believe that cancer testing is the next frontier. So this technology is basically like a window into our health, shedding light on diseases at a stage when we can do something about it. And finally, I'd like to thank individual for my group for generating the data which I present to you. And thank you very much for your time. <laughs>